This episode is sponsored by Vulture, high-performance cloud compute, bare metal, and storage in 25 locations all over the world. Sign up and get $200 free credit to use in 30 days at getvultr dot com slash ldt. Hello and welcome to episode 47 of Linux Downtime. I'm Joe. I'm Adam. And I'm Martin. Good to talk to you both again. Today, I wanted to ask you both about progressing your career as a Linux and FOSS enthusiast. I know that software freedom and open source, let's say, are important to both of you. And I know that you've both had pretty successful careers so far in the industry. But I also know that there are quite a few people who succeed in the cloud world and Linux world who don't really care that much about the principles, which is fine. But they are just using these tools because they are the best tools, not because they are open source. So I wanted to pick both of your brains as to how you've progressed while keeping those FOSS ideals in mind. I'd say I've never really identified with FOSS itself. I think I've said in the past that, you know, the value I've seen in those licenses is not because of the um, freedoms that, you know, uh, in air quotes, freedoms that they provide, but more those licenses mean it's a way to create things and build things with a vast array of software and other collaborators around the world. You know, it breaks down those boundaries. And certainly my experience is you very rarely in industry hear people refer to FOSS, you will hear them talking about open source and they see value in creating and building with open source software for much of the same reasons that I've just described. You do. You also come across quite a lot in, I think, every industry, the notion that, oh, it's open source, therefore it's free and we can just use it. So you have to kind of prepare yourself as an advocate. If you are an advocate for the I'm going to call it more hippie side of open source. You have to be prepared to hit the corporate side of, oh, well, this is free. We can just use it. I think there's a distinction there about the people that are making and using open source software. So if we talk about like cloud and server and services and all of that sort of thing, there is definitely a group of people who use all of that great open source tooling, the very software that powers the fabric of the internet, and they use that software freely and then build upon it maybe their own website, their own service, their own platform. And the software that they create is not open source. It's software that sits on top of an open source stack. But then you do also see organizations who build on top of an open source stack, but also make their software available as open source, which is the organization I work for, which is Slim AI, does precisely that. We use and make open source. There's kind of two scenarios that you as a software engineer, if you are interested in FOSS ideals or even just open source as a concept, you have to make a decision at some point. Do you go down the path of the company, as you describe, Martin, who uses open source, builds on open source, contributes back to open source, or do you go down the path of the company who doesn't necessarily do that, but who, if you progress in your career in a certain way, you might be able to ultimately influence to do something for the greater good? Yes. And I think that a compelling case can be made in that last scenario that you describe. And I have been successful in doing that a few jobs back where I joined a company who were very much in a proprietary industry, which was the aviation industry. And everything is is closed and secretive there. And they were looking to create a new generation of analysis software. And we had a discussion about that very early on. And I made the case for, well, let's do this as open source, because here are some of the benefits. And we can get into a discussion about that later, if you like. And, you know, they did some due diligence. We spoke to uh, Moorcroft Law. You'll know Phil Katz probably. And he gave us some advice. And we decided to go down this route. And we were able to disrupt the incumbents with open technology. 
which was fantastic. So it can be done. Wasn't that more of a financial decision than an ideological one, though? Or in fact, wasn't it completely financial? Uh, no, no, it wasn't financially driven. I mean, the what was financially driven was the desire to create our own platform because the proprietary solutions we were using were eye-wateringly expensive and the company was small. And for us, we couldn't grow at the rate we wanted to because we couldn't afford the incremental cost of each license, which was nearly a quarter of a million euros per seat. Ouch. So when you're looking at that as your budget for how much it's going to cost you for each new analyst in the company versus we could put some of that money into developing our own software, you know, financially that stood up. But also there was already a movement within, you know, government organizations in the US to move towards, to favor contract solutions that were built with open technologies because they wanted that transparency. You'll have heard podcasters that are interested in Linux desktop talking about the advantages of using something like LibreOffice because it's an open standard for the file formats and therefore there's longevity in those file formats and you're not beholden to somebody. And, you know, governments around the world agree with that stance and prefer to base large, you know, contracts and what have you on open technologies. And am I right in thinking that the software that you wrote has become something of an industry standard now then? It did, yes. I mean, I, I'm. it's a long time ago now, so I haven't had any involvement with it. But it was, at the point at which I left, it was just about to get rolled out for the vast majority of commercial aviation safety analysis in the world. Um, so, And I believe that that happened, but I don't know the current status. There's different aspects when it comes to the, the benefits of open sourcing something. You, you, there might be a financial incentive. There might be a backwards compatibility. There might be you are a public body. Therefore, the formats that you use have to be open so that anybody can interact with them. Looking at you, any public body that still uses a Microsoft format of some description. But the one argument that I found anecdotally, which doesn't usually hold water with businesses, and which is why I don't use it as an argument, is the argument that it's morally right. You get a lot of people in Floss who say, we should open source this because it's morally right to do so. You know, it gives back to the world. It gives back to the software industry and it doesn't hold water with a lot of people. You've even added the L now to Floss to make it Floss. <laughs> <laughs> well, I thought about the moral side of it and I went, oh, I should stick the L in there. Yeah, I think from a business perspective, that's rarely going to fly as like the key motivator. But that's not to say that when organizations do embrace creating free and open source software, that they are bettering the world as a result. Because as you say, it means that people can learn from and build upon those technologies. And it's, well, it's science at that point, isn't it? Now, I know that both of you like to run Linux on the desktop. There must have been points in your career where companies you've worked for don't want you to use Linux on the desktop or want you to install proprietary antivirus on top of Linux or just want you to use Windows and Exchange or whatever. How have you managed to avoid that or have you just sucked it up as needed? So yes, I've been in that position. In fact, uh, one of my jobs a long time ago is I was a Windows Enterprise architect. So I was responsible for building a forest of domains in large uh, in a large IT organization and so that was a global effort you know from uh, Japan all the way across to uh, the west coast of the US and every country in between and so yes I was using whatever versions of Microsoft Windows were current then even though at home, I was using Linux. And I did get to the point, it was around the time the very first versions of VMware Workstation became available. I actually switched. And I started running first Slackware and then Crux Linux on my work laptop. And I had all of my Windows stuff in a VM. And that was how I was able to bridge that gap so that I was, I was a happy... And I wasn't doing this for any software freedom reason, I'd been brought up on Unix and I was much more comfortable using Unix than Windows. And that I just wanted, you know, for things like browsers and email and what have you, I wanted Linux on my laptop. I want to do the Jurassic Park joke for two episodes running. <laughs> 
I use Windows very fleetingly in one job because I had to for a particular uh, for a particular reason that I won't go into. But other than that, I've used Linux mostly uh, universally in all the jobs I've done, including as a consultant. The other thing that I've had to use and actually I've been okay using is macOS. Now, a lot of people will wrinkle their nose at that, but the fact that it is Unix under the hood and the fact that all the tools you use are relatively similar to the tools that you will use on Linux means that using macOS isn't as painful, for example, as having to use something like Windows. So given the choice, I'm fairly liberal when it comes to Linux or macOS in my work environment, but that's also because I spend a lot of my time on servers and a lot of my time on remote systems or writing things that don't require me to interact with the local OS that's sat in front of me. So I definitely have discomfort when I have to use Windows for work-related things, but it's never been something that has impacted me to the degree where I've wanted to quit a job over it, for example. Okay, this episode is sponsored by Collide. Go to K-O-L-I-D-E dot com slash L-D-T to sign up today. Collide sends employees important, timely and relevant security recommendations for their Linux, Mac and Windows devices right inside Slack. Collide is perfect for organizations that care deeply about compliance and security, but don't want to get there by locking down devices to the point where they become unusable. Instead of frustrating your employees, Collide educates them about security and device management while directing them to fix important problems. Collide helps deal with some of the many issues that are not solved by locking down devices, like instructing developers to set passphrases on unencrypted SSH keys, finding plain text two-factor backup codes and teaching end users how to store them securely, and convincing employees to uninstall evil browser extensions that may sell their browser history. You can try Collide with all its features on an unlimited number of devices, free for 14 days, no credit card required. Try it out at collide.com slash L-D-T. That's K-O-L-I-D-E dot com slash L-D-T. So Joe, I think your original question was how to progress your career as a FOSS enthusiast. And I think we've talked a little bit there about, you know, the use and application of open source and maybe the considerations that organizations have today about the use and investment in open source software. But what we haven't talked about is being an enthusiast. And what I'd like to know is, do you think simply being enthusiastic about FOSS software is enough to A, start a career or sustain and develop a career in uh, free and open source software communities? I would say definitely not. No, it's not enough to start or sustain a career. I think that you need to do a lot of work as well as being enthusiastic about it, but surely it helps. Let me turn it back around on you. You have hired people. If you find out that a candidate listens to Linux podcasts, say, or regularly reads Reddit and tries new distros, stays up on the news versus another candidate that's just a nine-to-fiver that knows their stuff totally, but wouldn't even dream of looking at Reddit or downloading this podcast. Surely you're going to favor the enthusiast at that point. Yeah, it's certainly a differentiator that not only I pay attention to, but often swings the final selection between candidates. And I think you're alluding to, you know, when I was at Canonical, I hired Hayden Barnes, who was known to me through, you know, the Linux community, uh, going on Jupiter Broadcasting podcasts, talking about WSL and the distributions that he was building based around WSL. And he was clearly not just a thought leader, but, you know, technical leader in that space. But even going back, other way, in the job I'm in now, we've hired somebody that I know that I've come to know first and foremost through like this extended community of people that follow the various Linux podcasts. They now work with me where I am now. They were the one of our earliest hires and they came through the community, through the community at Slim AI, but originally through my connection with, you know, the different communities that we have. And I've done that at several jobs in the past. Yeah, I'm not saying just people who listen to podcasts necessarily, but say they contribute to Ubuntu Mate, say, they might catch your eye that way and be more likely to be hired for, even if it's something unrelated, like what you're doing with Slim AI. It's also having like a demonstrable public record of your technical acumen as well. You know, if you if you are playing an active part in any community, and actually this doesn't just 
apply to technical capability. You know, maybe you're a translator, maybe you're a documentation writer, maybe you, um, I mean, one of the things I found particularly useful is the people that have really invested time in QA. You can identify all manner of people that are well skilled. And I think that's the thing. You need that FOSS enthusiast, as it says in our opening question. But when paired with a skill, it's pretty potent and compelling that these are people that are going to be highly motivated. Yeah, I mean, I'd concur with most of that. I, Whenever I have been in a position of hiring people, one of the questions I ask is, you know, what's the computer that you're using right now? Is it something that's free and open source? And it's not a huge differentiator if there's a skill involved, but it definitely factors into the equation of, is this person someone that I could see myself working with on a daily basis? I think that is important because it builds that sense of, okay, yeah, you, you don't just know what you're talking about. You're clearly enthusiastic mm -hmm. to bring it back around. And therefore, yeah, I think you probably are a bit more motivated than the next candidate along. And to the point about uh, public contributions, it's very, very common on every CV that I've certainly seen for the last few years to see a GitHub link. Absolutely. And yeah. that is the social coding element. That is, for better or worse, whatever your opinion on GitHub might be, it has become the de facto standard for where you go to see my profile as a developer. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, it. like I said, it's a, it's a distinguishing factor. If I've got two candidates, especially if they're, you know, young coming out of university and have effectively gone through the same set of syllabus material over their time at university, if you have one, on the one hand, somebody who is engaged in personal projects or community projects and can demonstrate they're passionate about what they do, whereas somebody else may look like a nine to fiver you're always going to favor that person that's got that edge, that flair. What advice would you have to someone who's interested in Linux and open source and maybe even cares about software freedom and the copyleft side of things? They want to get into the industry. What's your advice to them? So it used to be that you would say, well, you need to install a LAMP stack and get familiar with it. That was the sort of advice that was given out to to grads, people fresh out of university that might not know how to get started. So you install your web server, you install your database, you install a Linux VPS somewhere and you break it. That still holds true, I think. The difference is that whenever I suggest it to people these days, and I do suggest it quite a lot, I will typically skew it towards whatever they're interested in. So right. to bring it back to gaming, I typically say, well, install a Minecraft server somewhere manage it, look up the software that you use to manage that server. Minecraft itself might not be open source, but there's plenty of tools around it that you can use to manage that. If you're feeling particularly adventurous, look into Kubernetes and you know run a server as a pod on a Kubernetes installation, if it's an area where it's of interest to you. So there are things you can do to show that keenness, even if it's just a activities I've done paragraph on your CV, or if you can say, well, you know, Here's a link to the Minecraft server that I set up. I think that shows a willingness and it's something that's a bit more interesting than just here's my blog these days. Yeah. If you've got an idea about what it is you want to be doing, the nature of the organization that you'd like to work for and maybe sort of the technology sphere you want to be working in, try and find a project or an organization that is doing the things and reflects the things that you care about and make yourself known to them. Every open source project has a community. Get involved in the communities for the software and projects that you care about. Make yourself known to the organizations. We were talking last week about, you know, commercial sponsors of Linux distributions. Make yourself known to the people who are sponsoring projects and separate yourself, you know, make meaningful contributions, get involved, even if it's advocacy, you know, um, do live streams about it, make videos and educational content around things. Do talks at your local hack space or meetup or, you know, code club or whatever it might be about the technologies you're interested in. Then tell those organizations about those talks you've been given. This absolutely works. And I've done it many times going back decades. I, I really wanted to work at Sun Microsystems. I'd worked with Unix previously. I was mad keen about Linux. At that time, Linux jobs were very scarce. 
And so I decided, well, I, I really want to be working with Unix. The biggest Unix vendor is Sun. So I made a play to join Sun. And then years later, I did that again. You know, I'd, I'd spent some time uh, working in aviation and big data center stuff. And I really wanted to work with desktop Linux. And I worked very hard to make myself known to Canonical and the Raspberry Pi Foundation, because those were the two organizations I really wanted to work for. But you don't just get offered a job, you know, randomly out of nowhere. You have to work hard sometimes for many years to put you in a position where you're the only obvious choice. Well, yeah, you must have secretly wanted to run the Ubuntu desktop team. And the Ubuntu Mate thing must have factored into that, even if it was subconsciously. Yeah, I did. In fact, I think I spoke to Popey about a job opening at Canonical for the engineering manager for the Ubuntu desktop. And I think it was Will that got that role. So, you know, when he originally got that job. So, you know, but, you know, in the meantime, I was actually really enjoying getting back to software development. and But I spent a lot of time working on Ubuntu Mate, making myself known to people. And then, you know, serendipity, Will hired me a couple of years later. I think you made an interesting point there about Linux user groups as well. Um, I'm just going to highlight that again, because yep. Linux user groups are invaluable, especially if you're looking in your local area, or if you happen to be in a city, or if you can travel to a city. Those are the environments where faces become commonplace. You learn the locals, you learn the people that go to all the meetups for all the different tech stacks. Mm-hmm. And not being shy about it, companies do actively seek people out at those meetups. You will always get somebody there. They might not be an engineer, but you do get people that are looking to hire people at those meetups. And if you impress, then they have, you know, there are cases of people going, have you considered working for blah? Because we're always hiring. So that is an invaluable idea. Definitely. Yeah, absolutely. And I was hired through uh, my local Unix user group a few jobs back. That was exactly how I was hired. They got to hear from me from somebody that worked at the company they came out to one of the lug meets one weekend and gave me an informal week, uh, you know, job interview. And a couple of weeks later, I was working there. Okay, this episode is sponsored by Vulture. Go to getvulture.com slash LDT to sign up and get $200 free credit to use in 30 days. Vulture offers high performance cloud compute, bare metal and storage in 25 locations all over the world. You can pick from 12 operating systems, including Windows, or you can bring your own ISO. Vulture's Marketplace offers one-click installation of more than 50 applications and operating systems, including Minecraft and other game servers, VoIP and VPN platforms, content management systems like WordPress, and cPanel. Also, check out their optimized plans, CPU, memory, and storage optimized instances, featuring the latest AMD Epic chips. So go to getvulture.com LDT to get your $200 credit and support the show. That's G-E-T-V-U-L-T-R dot com slash L-D-T. Bit of admin then. First of all, thank you everyone who supports us with PayPal and Patreon. We really do appreciate that. You can find out more at linuxdowntime.com slash support. And for $10 or more per month on Patreon, you can get an advert-free RSS feed that includes this show, Linux After Dark, and Late Night Linux. And if you want to get in contact with us, you can email show at linuxdowntime.com. You know, I'm listening to what you two are saying here, and it's great advice, but I don't think there's anything particularly unusual about what you're saying here. You're saying, do the thing you want to do until you're good enough to get paid for it, and put yourself out there, whether it's in person at these meetings, whether it's online, meet people, network. You could apply this to any job, surely, any career. You can. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I took a career break a few years ago and I spent six months going to sort of uh, how an older generation sort of pivots their career. And there was a broad spectrum of people there from all sorts of industries. And the advice was the same, irrespective of what it is we wanted to be doing. And I think the key point that you've made there is it's the networking and putting yourself out there. That is so vital. If there's something you really want to do, you really have to follow through on being a little bit shameless in putting yourself out there, networking and getting to know people. The dream job rarely falls in your lap out of nowhere. Yeah, I didn't fall into my quote-unquote dream job right out of the gate. I 
started my career working in a data center as a hardware rack and stacker, basically. And it wasn't what I wanted to be doing, but it was close enough in a company that I could move internally with, or at least I thought I could move internally with, separate story, but it got me in the door. I think the most important thing is getting your foot in the door. And if there is, if your dream job isn't there and isn't hiring, broaden your horizons a little bit, look into an area that might be something you can shift out of later on. Yeah, It's... Um, Essentially, not a route that a lot of, that everybody will want to take. But you know, put your finances first if you need a job because you need to pay your bills. That is still an option. Yeah, I think that's an excellent point, and and certainly something I've done in the past as well. There's another side to this, of course, which is if you're in the situation where you have had to compromise on some of your beliefs. If you are in a company as a new individual and they don't have a lot of open source contributions or they don't write open source software, but they do use it, then there is still that capacity for growing in the company yourself and becoming that voice of advocacy within internal to the company. Mm -hmm. I think if you can carve that niche out for yourself with constructed arguments that don't boil down to, as I said earlier, we should do it because it's morally right. There is a place for that in, I think, most organizations, and you can change hearts and minds by having things like, well, if we made this software as a software as a service offering, and if we offered it with this payment plan, it doesn't matter that we've also AGPL'd it and we've made it open source because people will still come to us. We are the de facto maintainers of the software and people will come to us for the most recent version of things. You can build that sort of argument up yourself and you can become the person internally who knows about open source, who knows about FOSS and who the company might then go to in the future if they think, oh, maybe this would be better if we open sourced it and we got that momentum behind our software. So there are options down the line, even if they don't seem obvious on day one yeah and you can advocate for hiring that person who is working on this crucial bit of software that you're relying on as well absolutely yeah you can go oh hang on a minute we've got this bug in this particular tech stack why don't we just hire the engineer who's working on it in his spare time or at least make him a job offer and i think that goes beyond just like development positions as well because if you're the person inside the organization that has a good grasp on infrastructure and the open source software that powers infrastructure, then it's often possible to make a good sort of business case around moving away from proprietary solutions as there's that natural attrition and build up of technical debt in, you know, enterprise infrastructure to a solution built on open source. And by doing that, you are crafting your own path to being the expert in that, potentially creating a department that is the open source infrastructure team that you now lead or uh, a senior engineer in. So I think it goes beyond just development as well. Yeah, and that's something we've touched on a few times, but I think we really need to ram that point home that a career in open source does not mean software development necessarily. It definitely can, and that is a huge part of it. And it's kind of the nucleus that everything else orbits around, but there's a lot of stuff orbiting around that nucleus. You've got documentation, community people, management, just people management is a real skill. And people management as someone who understands Linux and open source, FOSS, whatever you want to call it, that is a huge skill and it's very desirable in this industry. Yeah, uh, content creators and copywriters and people in marketing and sales that have a vocabulary and a competency in open source technologies are in high demand. I do wonder sometimes if that's the reason why it isn't as popular as it is in uh, corporations. Maybe there is just a fear associated with, oh, how do we deal with this big, scary community? Maybe there's a job which is just, I am a consultant who goes into companies and says, here's how you deal with this scary thing that is open source. Well, do let us know how you got into your open source career and what advice you might have for people. You can email us show at linuxdowntime.com. But until next time then, I've been Joe. I've been Adam. And I've been Martin. See you later.